with our first panel for today. Um, the first thing we introduce our moderator for today. Um, welcome, Anjali Shivam. She will moderate our panel today, so yeah, you come up. <laughs> our first panel for today is Queer Love. I think my will give you a better introduction on it than I can. Um, our panelists for today are Theophilus Akrotis. Um, can you come up? Khan. <laughs> and Kimba, sorry. <laughs> okay. So yeah, enjoy. <laughs> um, also, just as a disclaimer, there is coffee and water available for you to buy upstairs if you ever get thirsty, and we shall be here. Thank you. Can I introduce Gus and also can we remove this because I'm going to be sitting Hello everyone, um, thank you so much for coming out on this cold rain day um, for a beautiful, for what, for, for what I promise will be a series of beautiful and important conversations. Um, we are starting of course with the conversation on queer love, which is something that is very close to many of our hearts and I know that um, as queer people this is something we are constantly negotiating um, and it's we are negotiating it through such difficulty because of the kind of hateful, um, oppressive and violent messaging that we have to deal with as queer people in order to first love ourselves, let alone one another. And I'm joined by a beautiful and a esteemed panel today who are going to share um, from their own writing, from their own works, and their own personal stories about how they negotiate love. And you know, hopefully after this conversation, we can all walk away with a stronger sense or better sense of how we can better negotiate queer love, because that is something we generally don't have a model on how to um, on how to to negotiate. So I'm going to start with um, brief introductions. I'm going to ask my panelists to briefly introduce yourself um, and your work, um, and, yeah, and the work that you have produced. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Theophilus Effortist, and um, I'm a personal development coach. Um, I'm a facilitator. I'm a speaker and an author. Um, I am also a spiritual director and the founder of Neo Healing Institute, uh, which is the platform through which I host my workshops and retreats um, for everyone. But the work that I do is um, mostly focused on um, in the queer community. Um, so monthly I host events and um, workshops and retreats for queer people to come together to heal, to awaken, to gather, to commune, and so that we can just um, take out the, 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 the work on the wounds that we have as a queer community because there's a lot of wounds that we have in the queer community that one, we don't talk about and when, if we do and when we do talk about them, it's, it, 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 it happens in, in corners where we, tr where, where, we should, um, where we should be having them publicly so that other people know about them. I remember when I was, um, I think I was five or six and I came to my grandmother and I told her so she was sitting with my grandfather, right? Mm -hmm. And I told her, I'm, um, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not a boy, right? And she said to me, you will not say that in this house. You will not, we pray to Jehovah here, right? And if Jehovah created you like this, this way, then this is what you are, right? And so that to me um, meant that telling the truth about who I am is not safe to the people that I love, to myself, it's not safe because I will be um, dismissed and you know not acknowledged for expressing myself, right? So, um, so then I grew up with that belief, right? And I sort of like, um, not trained myself, but I, I I con conditioned and programmed myself to hide who I am and to hide my truth mm -hmm. until I was in grade 11 and I had my library teacher and she saw right through me when I walked through the library door the first time and she said, um, so she used to call me Philly, right, and she said, 
Um, so she gave me books to read before she said that, but then one, one, one day she said to me, you have to vote for yourself because I see how you are all for, you know, you are always for the people but not for yourself. And that, just those words, you have to vote for yourself, that, that's a simple sentence, right? But that meant so much to me, you have to vote for yourself. And that was a day that I, that I, that I realized I've actually um, buried myself to make other people comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that was a big awareness for me, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I feel like when that happened, a lot of I had a lot of um, revelations, mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, um, awakenings, and a lot of um, awarenesses, right? And that just led me to who I am, to where I am now. But from then on, I realized that. Like you said, I, I sh I'm not the only person that feels like this. And I knew that I, I can't be the only person that feels like this. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, I, I feel deeply, right? And I wanted people to feel what I felt when um, Ms. Paxson said to me, you have to vote for yourself. And so, you know, I started, um, you know, sort of like, getting myself to do work like that, like, you know, from, so I used to write poetry, well, I still do, but I, I, I used to perform poetry back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I write poetry like that, uh, and, and perform poetry like that to, you know, to, with, a, with, a, with a, um, a message that says, you know, you are worthy, you are, you are beautiful just as you are, you are enough just as you are. And it just, you know, evolved to um, wait to self, yes. you know. And um, that was my voyage to self, mm. to the self, and to the greater self. Mm. And it's still a journey. I'm Jamil Khan, and I am a critical diversity scholar and also an author of Khamar, the Makings of the Black Islams, which is my autobiography, um, which is, uh, you know, obviously relevant um, because a big part of my, my life is about my queerness. Um, and I'm also an artist in residence at the University of Johannesburg, um, where I am working on a literary project that revolves around queer platonic love, just recognizing how um, libraries are and have been for so, 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 so long, such magical places. Mm -hmm. And they are fundamental shifts over many, many centuries that have happened for people in library environments, right? And there's a, there's a serious power that operates in those spaces, which is exactly why, um, historically, colonizers came here and burnt libraries down, which is why in the United States today, they are banning literature around, uh, you know, a black rape, radical thought and queer radical thought and even just storytelling that suggests that people like this exist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it must always be remembered that spaces in which books commune mm -hmm. generate a kind of power that really can change the world and has. Mm -hmm. And yes, there has been, and there has been, and there will be resistance to this, and there will even be violence that erupts through, through that resistance. Mm. But it can be made again and again and again and again. There's no library that was burned to the ground that stayed burned to the ground. It came back, <laughs> yes. you know. And then the other thing was, um, I'm so, I'm so happy that that's the, 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 the trajectory of that story. Um, because it reminds me of something that my, it reminds me of something that my grandfather always used to say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and relates to something that I said at the beginning of this panel was, uh, so my grandfather was somebody of very few words, and the, the words that he did speak, he couldn't put into English. Um, and so he always used to say, um, and that basically means, you are never too wretched to become better. Mm. And in the, the inverse is true as well, right? You must never think that you have become so good that you can't slip up and you can't fail, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's exactly what I was talking about. The fact that it's important to remember within all of this 
even though there's a lot of violence and pain and, and, and things that, you know, really difficult things that happen as a result of people's socialization, mm -hmm. we must always leave a, a window of opportunity open for people to become more human. Mm -hmm. My name is Ophila Kalimba. I am a maker. I write. I am a theater maker as well. Um, and I'm also a vocalist. Um, these things are always kind of expanding, so that's why I like to say that I'm a maker, because I like to explore different um, forms and creating an expression. Um, my debut novel is, it's a coming of age story, um, I, I prefer to say, uh, around a young girl called Ulaka, and how she navigates her queerness going from high school into varsity and basically experience and compilations of people and how people impact basically coming out to yourself more than anything else. So that's um, what the book explores. Currently, I am questioning how oranges live and die. This is, <laughs> this is my, yeah, this is what I'm exploring at the moment in many different ways. So I'm like, when do oranges die? They live, and I'm just fascinated about living things, like how things live, how things transcend, how they come to be, and how they pass. I think my my biggest thing, especially in coming to write this book, it's such an odd thing because I, I, I wrote the book when I was 19. Um, yeah. But then when I read it now, like in hindsight, I learned so much from what I wrote then, um, and what I, what I understand is that it's like a constant work because we're constantly, we constantly have to encounter people and we have to encounter how people treat queer people. It's constant work of, of creating, creating a space for yourself where you can come, you can come back to. Um, and for me, that's in my writing, um, because it, it, it always is the effective tool for me, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I took on, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a plan, like, oh, I'm going to write this book about this. It just kind of came out that way. Um, but it's been such a, a lovely experience to engage with people that resonate with the story and that find themselves in the story, because I, I think that's what's needed is for us to, to be able to tell our stories, to be able to share, to be able to say this is, this is what it was for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, to, and to be there for each other through our words and through our work. Um, and would you say that writing, writing helped you get to that point or you got to that point and then the writing you know, was sort of like an after effect of, of that? You no, know, the writing definitely helped me get to the point because at the point when I wrote the book, um, I was also questioning a lot about my queerness, my sexuality, especially in relation to like my family space. Mm -hmm. um, and in writing the book, it's like the things that I couldn't, I couldn't articulate out loud, I was able to articulate through the book. Yes. And then it gave me the power to be able to kind of confront those things in reality as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the writing came first before I kind of became accepting of myself. The second session is on queer storytelling. Um, and yet again, we're joined by another wonderful panel of, of writers. I have written in a variety of formats, uh, from poetry, short stories, and, and a novel. Um, so we'll get quite different perspectives on the process of writing, the act of storytelling, and why that's particularly important for, for the queer community. So I'm going to start off with asking a very wonderful panel to briefly introduce yourself. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jane Thompson. I'm a writer of fiction, poetry, um, some essays, and dabbled in some playwriting as well. This is my daily novel, um, The Institute for Creative Dying. Um, came out last month, yeah, last month. Um, and I'm also an educator, an academic at the University of Pretoria. Um, my focus is in South African literature, um, and specifically emotion and how emotion is represented in 
literary and visual culture. So listening to the, the previous panel, um, it struck me, because um, in your previous interviews, uh, um, one of the questions I usually, like, why death? Why you just quite what got you started interested in death? And listening to the previous panel, this, this, this idea that death follows queer people throughout their lives. Mm. And I was like, oh, maybe that's why, <laughs> where the, the interest in death comes from. Um, well, because I've always had to speak myself against death or imagine myself against death so often. And so when it came to imagining the different perspectives, um, I think I think being queer, you're already on the outside of, of sort of comfortable identities, normative identities, and so it gives you a different slant on the world, a different way in which to imagine otherness and what's more other than trying to write in the voice of someone else. You have to actually put yourself, your own world needs aside in order to really show the complexity of your character. Uh, because they, I mean, in the, in the novel, there are characters who, whose worldviews are very homophobic, are very um, masculine or hyper-masculine. And I challenged myself to to write in that character's language, to embody that character and how they moved about the world and how they thought about the world, while still, like I say, showing the window of humanity um, and where that even a character like that is pushed to reconsider um, the other people that he's in the space with that are different from him, that are queer, um, and life circumstances sort of bring him to a point where he has to show up for the other queer characters um, in ways that that are sort of dependent on both their survivals. Because there's this one incident where everyone's life at the Institute is threatened and it's the homophobic character that kind of is is, has responsibility sort of put on him to save everyone. And so it's like this kind of imagining of otherness and alterity, but also showing that that there's complexity here, that you need one another's otherness in order to get a full view of what this existential experience of living and dying is. Hi everyone, I am Lawrence Mashiane. I am Foremost, at the most, I would say I am an academic. Um, currently, I'm lecturing at Northwest University and I lecture academic writing or the academic process in writing. And I am also a writer. And in my writing, I focus on, I would say, experience. So, very interested in an experience. Um, the story that I wrote here is about a, an encounter. Um, so that's an experience of some kind. Um, I'm very interested in how we experience certain intimate moments and how we express intimacy. And the story tries to, or at least the character sees, or like he's concerned with how sex is just in certain spaces just seen as a, a carnal thing that people want to do. Like the point seems to be to just to just come, and once someone comes, it's the end of it. It is to realize that people want connection. In intimacy is about connecting with another person, right? And you'll see that in the story, when Caesar and his roommate finally have sex, at some point, you know, Caesar says that they stopped being in their bodies and began to connect almost metaphysically, like right? that, 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 that kind of psychic connection at the end of it, right? Because at that moment, they realize that this body is nothing without the person inside of it, without that human connection, right? And so to arrive at that, they had to first strip away these constructions about that, about sex itself, about it being a, about coming, right? That they first break that way and say that actually it's about connecting with this person. My name is Ariel Sanfranca. I'm a writer of fiction, of poetry, of essays, short stories, um, just about everything. <laughs> I've tried my hand at even plays. We were talking about earlier, the plays aren't really my thing. Um, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm a writer and editor, and uh, I've started doing book publicity, and I do all sorts of things. My writing is mostly concerned also with emotions and intimacy between people with the connections between people. Um, 
And I write about, obviously, not just relationships, love relationships, but familial relationships, the connections that we make with each other or don't make, the betrayals. And so that's, that's my main interest and my main passion. Mm -hmm. All I can say really is that some things come to me as poems, and I know that they're poems, and some things come to me as stories. They, they need a bigger development. I think with the poetry, I was expressing love, and the medium of poetry was short and sharp, so to speak, and those feelings fitted into that. They, they kind of demanded a snapshot. Mm. And so for me, they were snapshots of love and exploration mm. and, and falling in love. Mm. I, I like that you use snapshots because I was going to ask, since, uh, since you said um, poetry and, and stories, you know, some things come to you as stories and some things come to you as, as poems, and what, what would you say is the difference there? Um, well, I think sometimes I think of a feeling or a moment. Okay. And when it's a moment, like the poems in, in Beyond Touch, um, they prefer to the relationship that I speak of. There were moments, there were moments of connection, moments of finding ourselves mm. within that relationship. Mm. But then there are other stories that I've written where they aren't just moments, they are stories, you want to know what, or I want to know what the people are doing in the stories. Mm -hmm. there's, there's more to it, there's mm -hmm. um, far more than just a moment. Mm -hmm. And of course poetry can be more than just a moment. I mean you can write a poem about a war that takes place over a hundred years, you know, um, so the poetry isn't just moments, the poetry serves quite well, um, and poetry is also very good entry for people to, to read to other people, mm. you know, sometimes you just want to say something quick, and a poet has said it for you, and so you, you read the poem to somebody else. Um. My third year of queer knowledge as a kind of um, pushing back, mm -hmm. you know, to power that is that has been oppressive and, and challenging. And you know, perhaps you know to try and narrow down this, this big question on you on your work and all commoners are the same. Like how do you in terms of creating this this world and around the it's three different women, the characters, um, like how do you perceive of that project as a kind of contribution to towards queer knowledge because there must have been a kind of wanting to contribute to to queer knowledge in, in ways that you understand it to be. Absolutely not. Interestingly I don't care for words. I think words are a waste of time and think they're rubbish. Um, I think that queer knowledge is is performance. I think that queer knowledge is dress. When you swear, um, I don't think that you can swank on like a queer person. I just think it's impossible um, to, to be as stylish and to, to know. You know, um, I think queer knowledge is music. Um, for me, queer knowledge is queer nafasi and ule mat hosa befetu as a stage. It's all tiny swamas wide doing very sexual things with indonga yake. If I, I don't think that, so for me, and there was a time when, and in some cases, also there's another thing on, oh my god, all these words are English, rubbish. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so you'll find in my, in my <coughs> Sunday Times shortlisted. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll find in that book, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of music. Like my book sort of takes you through um my kitchen on a Sunday and in the background there's my study and now my study. Um so I am very I don't the, the word for me is 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 I'm stuck here. I am unfortunately stuck in words because the colonial project has said that this is the only knowledge that exists. Um, I can't breathe here. Um, in fact, I think in almost all of my writing, I always start with a quote um, by Zora Neale Hurston when she says, I feel the most colored and painted against a white canvas. I am stuck in words. I wish I could. I, in fact, and this is part of my current academic work because I am interested in the performances of violence of queer masculinity. So I don't care for the binary either, it's how you self-identify. So if somebody comes to me and says they're queer and for me, I'm just like, 
You can other research can be done. Yeah, people were totally the idea about the, the idea of not having a, and I think that's a, also trying to get with this question of not having a, a model mm -hmm. um, for how to live our lives or you know, love and move about the world as, as queer people. And um, I'm interested in, in what that looks like for you in the writing process where there hasn't been a, a kind of, you know, model voices or authors that you are like, these are, these are my examples or beacons of light and, and having to kind of begin to, to chart a path in, in that regard. Sure. So for me, again, I think the word erasure, yeah, um, because, so I, mean, I don't know, again, let me just gather my thoughts, I remember again. So I, it, it matters uh, when we say that there's an erasure of queer knowledge where we are being erased, right? Um, and who's doing the erasing. So even when we say I'm silencing, um, I mean, what if people want to be silent, you know? I think of Mozella's work called The Mint Always Speak, um, and she's researching Swati women and, and, and or rather womanhood in, in, in the African context because all these Western feminists that arrived and be like, oh my god, African women are silent, and she's like, no man, so much speaks in, in a lot of the things that these people are doing. It doesn't need to come, you know, I, this is not the only method of communication, right? So that's my one one thing. And then I want to again go again, so who, where and how are we erased? Um, well, can form erased and silent um, is important. So I want to say, so back when I was again doing my masters, um, and so and I'm, again I'm doing this because I can struggle with whiteness, you know. Um, so, I, the, the reason I researched Thor is because it, I, I felt that in such a masculinized process, right, it's the soup king in the Arayan, um, there's a, in fact, the chapter is called All the King's Men, in my opinion, because, you know, the, this king has made this process that has to do with girls' vaginas about him, and I'm like, okay, but there's women who are partaking in this thing, what, what's their thing, because all I read was, you know, the league, because I also said, you know, and apology for my problems, I read a lot. So, um, so I think I've been, it was during really law school when I was realizing all of these um, laws around the black ritual, black practices out there. I was like, wait, what? why are these white women, and why are they saying so much, you know? Um, and so I wanted to hear the voices of the women who are touching these vaginas, right? And why are you a part of this masculinized process, right? Um, which why I found out that Zubinus is not a real thing. It was created by the British. Shaga is not real. Like, oh, oh my god, oh my god, my <laughs> um, But one of the things that I found here, yeah, just to go back to the question, is I, one, I remember that one of my first days in the field, the Sepa scene was being long, right? So it's a collection of like women and girls. And, so, and the law said you can't be, to, you can't be um, tested before the age of 12, and there were eight children, and I'm in this bus, and again, I'm an anthropologist, what the fuck is that? How am I explaining to these people that I'm, I'm just here to stare at you and write something at the end, you know? Like, nobody's quiet, but this food, this one, so they're giving me that space. So I'm in this bus, and then this woman, remember, she's a doctor now, doctor of history, actually, um, has a, a moment, a spiritual moment, where she is exercising the spirit of Gabbard in this car, and I'm like, how oh, do you know? <laughs>
to find queer knowledge, I think one has to dig and dig. And you can find it in, in many novels where the word queer is not even there, the word lesbian is not even there, the word um, homosexual is not even there. You can find it once you start seeking and looking. And once you know that queer knowledge has been brought to the surface through, I think, fiction mm. yeah. and creativity. So we know, so someone said in the last panel that they wrote they wrote to write a lot about their own personal experiences. I never do. Mm. You draw from from people's from other people, other stories, the outside world, what's happening, what's not happening. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, part of what we were also part of the conversation earlier was the, that difficulty of, you know, are you ever divorced from, from what you are writing about and the kind of your personal experiences and, and what you are writing? What's, what's your experience with that? I don't really understand. Um, like, what's your, how do you bring or make sense of your own personal experiences? Yeah. You just leave it out yeah. completely. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's quite that's quite tough, you know, for, for most of us. At least for me, I feel like one is always kind of within themselves. But the other writers again can say you you refer to you deal with their writing um, separately. Um, but I'm also told we are running out of time. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor for one, two, three questions. <laughs> Any questions? No, no that was. Is <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the question we had earlier as well was on deciding who to write for, um, which I was very curious to bring to this conversation about queer knowledge. Is how do you how do you negotiate that question of who to write for when when you sit down to, to produce these stories? I mean, uh, for me, you write, you don't write, you write for a reader, and a reader could be anybody, uh, and that reader is going to bring to your work whatever they perceive. There's a skip that's been happening where queer knowledge comes up, and then it gets hijacked. Mm -hmm. And and I, I believe go back and reclaim your old ground because if you can't get those stories back, there's no way any future stories are going to um, work in your favor because mm -hmm. you keep they keep being reinvented. They keep being repurposed for somebody else's agenda. So yeah, that's just my contribution to that. Who am I writing for? For people who uh, need to know what happened in the past and how we can repay it. Okay. Um, I'm very quick. Um, yes. Um, some of my best friends are white. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I grew up with white people. Like, yeah, I'm, I have a lot of my friends like live in a very white neighborhood. It's very unfortunate. Um, and 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 there are the big five books. And then rich people, <laughs> and then read books. So I honestly, I, I sure I wrote because um, somebody really thought. But like when I thought about who is going to have the two hundred and ninety five rents um, to go and buy the book, I thought of my rich white friends. I was like, buy my book. My <laughs> so that's what I reported that, okay. and it did really well. It seems that. Yeah. Uh, also, the, I think to also wrap up because we really are out of time. I wanted to ask on the question of how do we remove, you know, the you know the whole white tower as you know sitting here and having these conversations and acting on important because whatever, all of that as as it has come up in the conversation. How do we overcome that or you know become one kumbaya family and and fairness is at, how, how do we make queerness something that an experience that is shared across the board and not something to sit here and, and ponder on, but take it everywhere that like you were to say? If there was, you had a question. Yeah, I think it's more directed at potential. Um, I think Aaron and Fluke on I mean, I think we understand that is the fact that sometimes you are teen up, um, if you look at our blackness as the understanding. Um, and there seems to be this refusal to be erased then in, in the use of the English language. You said in your book, um, you, you kind of bend those rules also in your book um, by inserting, by inserting words that kind of like subverts. <laughs> 
um, the rules of, of literature itself. So would you say that we can still use English as a kind of a device for a refusal or erasure? Absolutely. Um, I think, in fact, that is part of the post-colonial agenda. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Homi Baba. Um, Homi Baba is this Indian philosopher who is a post-colonial thinker, uh, not a decolonial at all. My, I must be honest, I can't do it. I want to read fiction. I want to read Homi Baba in a fictional story. I want to read Derrida in a fictional story. I don't want to read or even call Christian theology or whatever because that's something which touches everybody, storytelling. Oh, um, I, I think the, 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 I think the Transport Migrant City project is a very particular project and queerness is, as it happens here and the Migrant City is a particular project, right? So, please leave the raw people alone. Please leave the raw people alone. And I cannot, so that's that call, it's on the way to, to Giant's house and the, I cannot imagine Brian there, because then you're going to come and gentrify and then everything is going to be really, really expensive. Just, also, why? Like, oh, how Brian exists here and why it exists. So I think I have a very much, leave, leave people alone. If they want to, to be a part of this queer project, there's a reason that we are in the spaces that we are to find breathing and existence in the spaces. That, this idea that, oh my God, it's, it's bridge gaps. Maybe the gaps are there for a reason. In fact, one of the biggest, the reason we are here is because the his people decided they wanted to bring together from the Atlantic. I think that humanity is such a. We will, if the gap needs to be, the humans will find a way to protect it. But let's not try our hardest to go, oh my god, let's take these conversations to those places. They're having their own conversations. Yeah, they're having their own very, very important conversations. But I mean, the interesting thing is in storytelling, people bridge the gaps themselves. Absolutely. 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 So they'll tell a story about their son who's married to another man. Absolutely. And, you know, so that's how we, that's how it works. I will just reiterate the storytelling, uh, because what, what often happens in rural, again, the rural areas that we must um, leave alone, is if somebody comes out and says, I'm gay, I'm LGBTI, or I'm a member of the LGBTI community, people are going to be like, what's that, what's that? And then suddenly you get this old grandma who's going to come along and say, listen, in my day, there was. Yeah. Then they'll tell you a story. Or they'll say uh, there was a, an ancestor who's now coming through this child. So they, they find their own, their own, they tell their own story that manages the this, this situation themselves. Yes. So I'm all for, if you can speak in solidarity with us, if who's doing that, yes. amplify their voice. But it has to be their voices. And, and, and that's, that's what I stand on. That. That's true. That's beautiful. Thank you for such a beautiful and heartfelt conversation.